hi everybody welcome back to the telegraph rugby podcast after another lively weekend of six nations rugby you're joined as ever by myself ben coles and i'm here in the studio with charlie morgan hi charlie morning coles and through the wonders of technology we're also joined by charles richardson bonjour charlie hey, bonjour uh that greeting might have given the game away but where are you mate and are you uh are you having a lovely time I am having a lovely time. I'm currently sitting in a um, fairly swanky cocktail bar in, in the centre of Paris, in the in the Parisian red light district. Um, that my friend, um, who I know, uh, shout out to the manager of the Little Red Door in Paris, has opened for me to specially record this podcast. So, um, yeah, I mean, I'm here by myself, and it's and there's no daylight. But other than that, it's uh, feels pretty it's swanky. better than a hotel room in Newcastle, is what you say? Well, yes, yes, yes. It's a it's a marked improvement on last week. Oh, I, oh actually, I don't know. <laughs> I just checked the uh, I checked the time and it is midday in Paris. So if you want to have a drink, then feel feel free. No judgment here. We'll uh, we will uh, be jealous. Maybe 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 <laughs> off, maybe maybe I'll reveal that off air. <laughs> Boys, let's dig into some highlights from the weekend from three very entertaining games. Uh, Charlie, what what did you like this weekend? You were in Cardiff, I should add, as was Charles before Charles nipped over to Paris. So. You've both been at matches. Charlie, what did you like? I was in Cardiff, but before kickoff there, I was watching Italy versus Ireland and Pierre Bruno's inception on the stroke of half-time gets it for me, just kind of summed up how Italy wouldn't go away, uh, summed up how intrepid they were, an opportunity, opportunistic try, nice finish from Bruno, but they were excellent just to stay in that game and do so sort of their own way as well. And um, We can get into it, but it feels like the Six Nations, I think we touched on it last week, has been sort of a Six Nations of two divisions and we had the four sides who have been building throughout the World Cup cycle playing off in those two games and no surprise those two games were markedly different to the one between the other two sides who are rebuilding under new, a new coaching team and Italy played their part. Charles, what did you like? Uh, I'm going to be boring and I'm going to copy Charlie actually. It's, it's Italy all the way I think that some of the I mean, how how often have we ever said during the Six Nations that, that some of the best attacking touches, some of the best constructed and best organised and most incisive uh, attacks on a Six Nations weekend have all come from Italy. They've not come from from their individual brilliance or a gnarly forward pack. They've come from genuine cohesion and everyone's singing off the same song sheet um and what they're building is is really exciting and they had Ireland on the ropes they had Ireland on the ropes and maybe only for 20 minutes or so that period just before half time to just after half time but they had they had Ireland on the ropes it wasn't as close as it was against France but um yeah they're building something I don't want to say special I don't want to get ahead of ourselves but they're certainly building something uh, the like of which we've not seen from an Italian team before it's tricky, isn't it? Because obviously they've not won yet, and yet they are so much better than in previous years. And you can actually see a structure and a plan to what they're doing that you you do get a bit more excited, don't you? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. And and they they have they have such great consistency to selection now as well. And that's basically an unchanged forward pack for the past three for the past three rounds. All of the all of the backs are developing a cohesion together. When you put Garbisi back in there, they look a, a different animal altogether. Um, n- nothing against Tommy Allen, but I just think Paolo Garbisi is a different class of fly half among the best in the world. Um, and when he's playing, th- there was a reason why they looked even improved on the first two weekends. Yeah, if I had to pick a couple out, I, I really liked Ollie Lawrence's try against Wales, just mainly because it was Ollie Lawrence and actually it's sort of just another note in what a crazy kind of season he's had I, I, the the Worcester stuff is still really fresh in my mind and also how he got binned by Eddie Jones a couple of years ago and to see him getting that try in Cardiff I thought was was really great and actually that was some of England's best play as well that, that sort of quicker passage towards the end of the game in Cardiff um, and also with Scotland Hugh Jones form as well at outside centre Charles just quickly we'll get into the game a bit more can, can you give us a snippet of what the atmosphere was like when France obviously went up 19 nil inside 20 minutes and, and what what was the mood like as Scotland kind of creeped back into that in the second half I mean arguably it was one of complacency you know it was um, it was rocking in the in the first 20 minutes France shot to a 19 nil lead and there was genuine fear that this could get very messy for Scotland very quickly um, 
But they didn't push on, and Scotland really did fight back, and the Mexican wave came out of the Stade de France, which you never want to see. And I think certainly in that period after half-time, um, in that sort of five, ten minutes after half-time, the atmosphere in the Stade de France and among the French players was very flat. And Scotland really did take advantage of that and profited from that. And they could. They could have they could have snuck that at the end. The scoreline doesn't tell the full story there. I know it's an eleven point loss, but it, it, it didn't it never felt like that. It's a good win for France against a Grand Slam chase in Scotland, but it never felt like an eleven point victory. Interesting. We'll chat more about that a bit later, but let's focus firstly on what happened in Cardiff. We we weren't sure if we were gonna get a game for a long about this time last week when we recorded, but we did. <laughs> I think who was it who said you weren't very sure Charlie about whether we were going to get a game you thought we might have a strike but we we did get a <laughs> yeah well we? just as the week as the week dragged on it felt like a more and more real proposition didn't it but no on Wednesday we got the got the white smoke and, and it went ahead so let's dive into it now and see uh, see how England managed to get a second win under Steve Borthwick Okay, guys, as we said, you were both in Cardiff. England getting another win. A, a really tough week for Wales, given everything off the field, which we sort of touched on last week. They did come to an agreement by Wednesday. The game did go ahead. I'm sure no one was more relieved than the Blazers at the Welsh Rugby Union, given the financial cost that would have come from actually not hosting that game against England. Let's focus on England first and, and then touch on Wales. It, is is it fair to say that England just showed a, a few more touches of improvement than maybe people are giving them credit for, Charlie, if I could come to you first on that? Yeah, I think so. If you'll indulge me, I'm going to try and begin Always. this with a really rubbish cricket analogy. So when you're in the dirt, when you're fielding for a long time and um, a back and side are piling on runs, you kind of always say, don't you, add two wickets onto the score, what does it look like? And to do that retrospectively at the end of the game probably feels really stupid. But if you think about in England... Spurned 10 points off the tee. They conceded a try from an interception. Wales threatened on threatened on the cusp of half-time, but England looked reasonably comfortable in defence for the, for most of that game. They did enough to get the rewards from Owen Farrell's kicks. Um, and beca- because of those misses, the game stayed tight for, for much longer. And you get a real kind of... And it's so dangerous doing that, obviously, I know, because... That, that all contributes to how edgy it is and how tense it is towards the end of the game. But I actually think that England's performance could easily have been, was enough to, to, to produce a kind of statement result. And then, you, and then you view everything a lot differently. I think Wales obviously took away or did their best to take away the mall from England as Steve Borthwick kind of hinted after the Italy game by that, with that infield kicking that, they, that has worked previously. And how it's worked is that Wales have been dogged in defence and they've been really disciplined. And England haven't had the weapons in the, with their phase play to break them down. But England did have a little bit more in attack. And I think the, we'll get on to the kind of influence of Nick Evans. But to have, you know, Ireland had to wait till the 74th minute for their fourth try against Wales on in the on the opening weekend and we know how cohesive and how multifaceted Ireland's attack is. England got three, could have could have got three got could have got that third one earlier and then set up a kind of a bonus point chase with Marcus Smith and Henry Arundel a bit earlier than they did. But yeah, I think I think quietly impressive. We've written down here what would you give it out, out of ten as an England performance? I I think six and a half. How's that? You having that? I might even go higher. What would you yeah, go I might for, even Charles? Go, I think I think I think I might even go seven. I'm I'm firmly in the I'm firmly in the Charlie camp here. Um, that that is a banana skin avoided and, and a bullet dodged really for Steve Both with, with all the emotion that was swirling around in Welsh rugby last week. Um, you know, you could see that Wales were up for it. You could see that they were, and there was a lot of heart and a lot of guts in that performance from them at the Principality, but they were just ultimately outclassed. And, and for, for Steve Borthwick, really, it, it, you're sort of damned if you do and damned if you don't, because if you went there saying, OK, um, we're going to chuck the ball around and show our most inventive attacking rugby, then slowly, when those errors start to creep in, a very emotional and fired up Wales feed off those, you know, feed off them, and, and then it could have got ugly, so what they've done is they've just tried to basically chuck cold water on that Welsh inner fire by going, being quite boring, being pragmatic, but boring in inverted commas, being pragmatic, um, and and getting the win. And as Charlie said, that you know that could have easily been thirty points to three. You know, you take away the. I know sport doesn't work like this, but if uh, the the bare facts are, if you take away the interception and add ten points from the boot of Owen Farrell. 
it, there's nothing to say that it would have finished 30 points to three, but all of a sudden, that's a humongous win, a uh, uh, ground where England have not won since 2017 um, against uh, a Wales team that were lacking in ideas, but immensely fired up. And I think, I think the context... I think the context of the entire match got a little bit forgotten with how sort of stop, start and stodgy the game was at times. So I think we we saw, and again, and we, we'll make this point again, that, that Charles and I covered Leicester particularly closely on their title run and their title winning season. But it reminded me of some of the away performances that Tigers put in um, in Europe. So against Bordeaux, less so against Connacht because they had to rescue themselves um, with a late try for, uh, for Jose Samaki, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, but also they, and then again this season at the Ospreys where all they want to do is suck out they want to do their best to to deprive an, a, a home side of any energy um, and outside ironically England gave Wales a bit of energy with um, Owen Farrell's charge down kick but Freddie Stewart rescued it which was a nice sort of little microcosm of the game um, because his solidity at the back was just really important as far as just not giving Wales any, any change out of that infield kicking game and because Wales were stayed reluctant to give England any uh, line outs they kept on with that kicking game Wales didn't have the confidence to run from much deeper than well certainly from inside their own half so all of those things all of those things are connected with how the game unfolds and England just stayed in front in a lot of facets and they did enough to kind of control that and this was a kind of I, I made the point to a fellow a, a colleague just at, at full time saying you know England haven't won here since 2017 he he, re, he retorted with that's three games mate even if you include the World Cup warm up which was a horrendous game in uh, 2019 but um, also it was their biggest win in in at, this, at that venue since 2003 and that gives you a bit more you know that's a bit more jarring isn't it because it was their biggest biggest win and they left. And it could have been a bigger margin too. I think it also says quite a lot about Wales that last oh, yeah, start as yeah. well, which I know we'll, I know we'll touch okay. on. This game is is really interesting because I I wasn't there. I watched it in a pub, and I thought it was so boring for large large patches, which was why I texted the two of you. Maybe the start of the second half, I can't remember. Was and I was sort of like, what's it like there? And when I think Charlie, I think you replied, and you were like, it's really tense, like. The atmosphere is kind of like this game could go either way. Well, these are t- these are two mm. neurotic teams as well. Yeah, aren't they? and sorry, England England are have been through a really neurotic patch. Maybe it's better to better to term it like that. And Wales could easily have played on that. In fact, I bet at the end of a, a two week sort of horrible two weeks, as Ken Owens um, kind of put, um, they would have wanted to play England out of any mm. of those six yeah. nation sides because they. Because they know that if they'd stayed in the fight, that those neuroses, for, those England neuroses, would have potentially clammed them up even more. Yeah, mm. I should probably have. Sorry, was, sorry, it, was it? Was it? No, no. It, it, just to touch on your point, Colsey, it was. I, I don't know if Charlie agreed. I, I, th- I think after kickoff, it, it was a little bit flat, flatter than usual. The atmosphere at the Principality, and that's not to criticise the the Welsh crowd in any way, because being frank, they weren't really given much to cheer about. You know, it's it's very difficult to to sort of artificially concoct an atmosphere when there's you know it all starts on the field doesn't it and as I was it echoes the point of the Stade de France yesterday when in that 19-0 when France raced to 19-0 and when the teams came out the atmosphere in Paris was electric suddenly when Scotland started grappling their way back into the game it died a little bit and I know that's what the the home crowd is there for to lift their team in those sort of moments but Sometimes it's a little bit difficult, and and certainly in, in in Cardiff it felt that way. Certainly because they started quite well, they started explosively, as you said. Owen Farrell was charged down, um, and that raised the cra- that gave the crowd a massive boost. But then when England started to get on top defensively with the chop tackling, with the dominant tackles, with the turnovers on the floor, when they just halted all Welsh momentum. The Welsh crowd got frustrated, and that's when you get people to and fro into the bar and the loo, and that's when it sort of you know the atmosphere dies a little. And that's a genuine. That would be a genuine facet of the England game plan to play yeah, so yeah, that the crowd are kind of yeah. taken out of it. Yeah. Um, so it's maybe a bit rubbish for people sort of watching, but it's good for England. Oh, yeah. it's, it's exactly the same as it's exactly the same as Scotland yesterday. It's funny you should mention that because just after half time, when the atmosphere did go a little bit flat in Paris. I, I looked down at the coaches box 
um, the Scotland coaches box and they were all very very animated that sort of period just after half time when they seemed to be on the up people hadn't quite taken their seats yet and I think they were feeling look it's flat in here France are probably at their lowest ebb energy and motivation wise just after half time they're a little bit cold we need to capitalize here this is this is our key moment where if we don't get points here then we're going to be struggling because the crowd will come back into it France will raise their game and lo and behold well they did in the end but it could have been uglier for Scotland had they not sort of capitalized on that sweet spot of the atmosphere dropping a bit and French sort of a bit of French lethargy after half time yeah, the point I guess I'm trying to make when I say it was really boring is that often we get matches where we, we'll be at a ground and we'll watch a game and we'll think, oh, that's a great game. And then we'll go and read the comments under a match report or player ratings and people will be like, what are you on about? Like, This is a rubbish game. I've never been so bored. I think I get it. <laughs> Now, oh, totally, because yeah. watching <laughs> large and norm, normally I'm like, come on, you just haven't seen it properly. But no, I get it because for so, for large portions of that game in Cardiff, it was like the ugly sister to the other two games because the, the, they were just terrible. Like the the large passages of kicking just sucked the life out of the game, and you could you could sell because you're watching in a pub. You see people going up, thinking, oh, I'll have a look at the menu, or might get a <laughs> drink, or might just might just think about an alternative. And then, funnily enough, actually, when England did managed to set themselves up I know that the Anthony Watson try did stem from a sort of kick return I think and at the end as well with the Ollie Lawrence try when England actually flashed a bit people are suddenly more interested so I guess what I'm saying is I understand when readers are a bit more grumbly about England and the kicking because if you're not there it can mm. seem quite dull. I mean, I, I had, I had, I had almost the reverse yesterday. I had almost the reverse of that. I was, I don't know if it was because it was just absolutely Baltic in the state of France, <laughs> and I was, that state I was gets cold. freezing, yeah. and I was freezing my proverbials off. I don't know if that was the case, but I had sort of people back home texting me about how great the game was, <laughs> and how it was an epic, one of the greatest ever, and I was sitting there going. I don't know. I'm I just I'm just not feeling that. I, I don't know. I don't know if it was because the French backline didn't quite click as much as we know it can, or because Scotland didn't win and were ultimately well beaten. I'm not really too sure. But I had people texting me saying how amazing this game was, watching it on the TV. And I don't know if it was just because I, I was shivering so much that I couldn't quite appreciate it. <laughs> it could it could be. I, I just before we chat a bit more about France Scotland, let's get a bit more technical about Wales England. Ch- Charlie, in terms of Nick Evans' influence, I think I've touched. I've sort of hinted at it there because talking about the two tries that England scored involving the backs which are quite exciting are you seeing a bit more of an influence sort of creeping in there and maybe a bit more of a a meeting of minds between what Nick Evans wants to do and what Steve Balfour wants to do yeah I am when I thought about making this point on the pod I was really worried about sounding like David Brent fusing um, flash dance with MC Hammer stuff but what they're trying to do in England <laughs> is is add in a, add sort of finesse Steve Borthwick's pressure plus fewer rucks in their own half, kicking, kick pressure, breakdown pressure with playing to playing with speed when they can and, and playing to space. And we are seeing a bit of that. Um, England, I know this is a cut. This I found this a bit, a bit of a jarring stat looking back at the game um, yesterday. England created eight clean breaks, according to Opta, in that game. That was the same number. If you take out the Italy game where they made 10 breaks in 2022, that's the same number as they made in all four of the other games combined. Um, that I've just found that remarkable. They're now up to 11 tries for the championship. They obviously scored eight in 2022. Mm. Um, what the speed, so one of the kind of facets of a few, re, few things um, to me that show the influence of Nick Evans, one of them sort of more obvious in how they're setting up a set piece, a little bit of a Harlequin's influence. Danny Kerr mentioned it on COCOMS, I think, on the BBC, that the, the scrum, um, the scrum move kind of a, uh, so Henry Slade runs a runs a short line that fixes uh, Owen Williams and then Owen, Owen Farrell drifts out a little bit to fix Hawkins and then there's the gap there on the inside for Max Malins. Um, then also Alex Dombrant um, in at first receiver in midfield and, and, pl- and playing tip-ons to Ollie Lawrence. So all of that set piece, that's a little bit different because we've, with England under Gleeson, they were always going through two distributors with, a, with that um, the other centre hitting that hard line. Um, and the other thing is, which is Nick Evans' absolute kind of hallmark is, uh, sorry, speed over structure. But I thought that England were using their structure 
to get out of structure, if that makes sense. And that's a that's a very Sam Vesti, who's the um, attack coach at Northampton Saints. So using what that means is really good example for Anthony Watson's try for a start. So the structured part is obviously the strike play, mm. but then Alex Dombrant gets really wide, gets outside Owen Farrell on the next on the next phase because that's the unstructured part and then they're playing to space and finding Watson um, but the best example I thought was actually Ollie Lawrence's try but if you watch that Owen Farrell's di- directing this structured play with normally what they'll have is three kind of three flat runners outside him a player in behind them who can so it'd be a secondary distributor who can play wider and then the other thing that they've kind of tacked on is that is one of the back three players on the inside of the fly half two so in the in the build up to Ollie Lawrence's try uh, you had Freddie Stewart coming on an inside ball and then a little bit later you had Anthony Watson coming on an inside ball and from there that gives them the impetus that they can play with speed and the structure goes out the window and Alex Mitchell uh, facilitated that really nicely because he was just buzzing buzzing from ruck to ruck and feeding feeding Farrell um, when they got the quick ball off Ludlam's carry I think it is after Anthony Watson's inside ball then the structure goes then it's all about speed mm. so the, the structure has done its work then it's about speed um, Mitchell plays in um, Henry Slade on another really nice line and then they go wide and they play to space so that kind of duality is where I'm seeing Nick Evans influence and if you tack that on to what Borthwick is bringing which is pressure plus kicking and also a quite a kind of what looks like quite a ro- robust game at close range now with the with mm. the mall and the pick and goes going a lot better than they were under Jones you're getting a rounded a rounded approach to having possession which is going to serve them well looking forward so the point on Mitchell is I think that, that, that is going to be a mini selection debate over the next couple of weeks even though they've been given different roles do you think Jack Van Portfleet is watching Mitchell sort of at, taking the speed of the game up from the bench and thinking I wish I was being allowed to play that way and not to the structure of the kicking game I appreciate this will, be, this will sound like I'm dodging the question but they want you want two nines to dovetail and knit together an 80 minute performance mm. in, in within any game and Jack Van Portflick, I thought, was very good generally at um, creating that, applying that pressure with those box kicks. So you had one that Louis Rizamit dropped in the second half. You had more that were so Alex Dombrandt claimed one in the in the run up to England's first three points. Um, England's chasers were allowed to exert that pressure because of how accurate those kicks were. Um, he had other moments like a really good, really good one on one tackle on on Thomas Williams. Mm. But they, I thought, they unleashed. Alex Mitchell at a really nice time because um, then it became all about playing to speed and I'm not saying not saying that Alex Mitchell can't do um, the kicking side of things because he's he's certainly rounded out as a player but I think actually how those two scrum halves knitted together was really nice and actually reminiscent of uh, Ben Young's Danny Kerr early in the Eddie Jones era so I thought that actually went really well and it will be a debate because Alex Mitchell, you you want to start like players talk about you know, but I'll take whatever role I can in the side. But they all want to start, um, and that will be kind of it's a nice head to head to have with Rafi Quirk um, surely eventually coming back into the into the consideration as well. If I could follow up on that, then do you think uh, the main takeaway I had watching it was that the, I get why England want to play the kicking game that they do, and I can see the benefits of it. But I also cannot see how they beat France and Ireland trying to play France and Ireland essentially a very similar game and how they might need to mix it up and do something different. So do you need more of Mitchell than eight minutes off the bench? Yeah, maybe, maybe, maybe. I mean, so they I thought I thought just how the way the way the game um, turned out. And we spoke about it at the time, didn't we? England, England spent a lot of time in possession against Scotland. And I wonder whether the game might just and then, and then it was sort of the opposite against against Italy and and less so Wales. Wales was sort of a bit a bit mixed, wasn't it? Um, they they have the players and, and Borthwick. And this is this is just one thing with Steve Borthwick. He's got with two weeks building up to a fixture, he will figure out. He spoke about how France kick long, and if you're taking and if you're taking kind of cues from that, you wonder whether ironically might might they look at more sort of backfield threats. So. England tried to kind of do that infamously last time they played France by moving Freddie Stewart to the wing, having uh, George Furbank at fullback and posting Ellis Genge back there. So interesting to see how if that's a big facet, or they or they might you know they might keep Freddie Stewart back there and be happy with France kicking long in in that regard, um, and just build up build up build, like stay in possession and, and use the kick return as a kind of um, 
a basis for that. Charles, we should have a chat about Owen Farrell's goal kicking. It wasn't great, as Charlie noted. He missed about 10 points off the tee. What was he saying afterwards about that? What was Borthwick saying? Well, Borthwick obviously backed him as he's always going to back his captain. And, and, and Owen did acknowledge that he did have an off day. But are these off days becoming more regular, um, perhaps? Charlie noted that since he since he had that ankle injury and came back with Saracens, that his um, that his goal kicking has not quite been the same. It's not been quite as reliable as it was once. Um, you know, he's 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 not at percentage wise at the requisite level for an international goal kicker. Um, could they have maybe given the ball to Slade on Saturday? Maybe I don't think you bring on Marcus Smith just for his goal kicking because you know as Charlie wrote. Yesterday in in the Telegraph, um, Farrell's all round game, despite the fact that there were a couple of a, a couple of dodgy kicks out of hand as well, he gave England a lot off the ball, as it were. So I don't think you have to ch- you don't I don't think you sub your captain off just just for goal kicking. But there certainly needs to be a, a backup option on the field, surely. I, I was just going to say that. So there were these ankle problems that he had that basically had a big, big layoff when they sort of really freakish back to back ones. But against, um, if you remember, I think maybe even more of a catalyst for it and, and where it really hasn't been the same since was he got injured against um, New Zealand, didn't he? And, and Marcus Smith took over for that mad finish. It was Marcus Smith kicking those goals. And then the next week, um, Owen Farrell missed a pretty kickable one against South Africa, albeit in quite windy conditions. And, and he hasn't been, um, certainly, certainly for England, he's been a bit iffy since then. And I think he's below 50% for the championship. Um, the Six Nations Championship at the moment, which really is a worry, more so because England are going to be reliant on fine margins because of just how they're playing and where they are and and this pressure plus kind of system, although, as we say, they're getting kind of a little bit more attacking fluency. Some Those games can be about small margins and they can be about grinding games out with kicks at goal and things like that. And if they're not going right and you're not getting the rewards and the game drifts in drifts and drifts and drifts when you haven't got the rewards as we saw even even in the first half after half an hour England would have preferred to be um, uh, further ahead than 8-0 and certainly in the second half as it, as it kind of prolonged um, it can be really costly we're going to chat a bit more about Farrell later in the podcast and just maybe what his role is going to be sort of going forward and, and at the World Cup but just a, a final point on England before we touch on Wales and then move on only um, 15 seconds off the bench for Marcus Smith. Um, similarly, little time for Henry Arundel. I, I think Borthwick said in his post-match comments that he didn't want to disrupt the team too much. I think that had been a takeaway for him from the Scotland and Italy games. Even so, uh, Charles, is that a bit disappointing to see Smith only get 15 seconds on the field? I, I'm I, I'm with Borthwick on this one, I think. I think... Um, the game was still in the balance, um, and Marcus Smith is uh, a match winner. You know, he's somebody to come on when the chips are down or when you're trailing um, to pull to pull a rabbit out the hat. England didn't need that. England didn't need that. They were superior to Wales, and it looked like they were going to win, and they did get the win in the end. What they needed was just somebody to tick the boxes, really. And, and, and Farrell is more of that than Marcus Smith, and he's certainly stronger defensively. Um, than Marcus Smith, so I, I'm, I'm an advocate of, of keeping Farrell on and not disrupting that midfield that was going so well. Is there a point in bringing him on for 15 seconds? I'm not really too sure, but um, I'm sure I'm sure cleverer people than I have have their reasons for for bringing him on for 15 seconds. I'm, I'm sure there is a reason to it because obviously th- there are there is the argument to the untrained eye that it's a little bit insulting and a little bit pointless, but. You know, there's obviously a reason for that. Um, what, I mean, is it worse to be an unused substitute? Uh, uh, sorry, an unused replacement. I'm not. I'm not really too sure. An, an unused, an unused game changer to uh, to borrow some, to borrow an Eddie Jones parlance. I'm not really. I'm not really too sure to be honest. Let, let's wrap up this section of talking about Wales. I mean, we talked about it. Plenty of plenty of heart. A really difficult week started with intent. It, it, sort of when you looked at. It really feels like Gatland is just trying to work out what he wants here because you had a rejig backline, didn't you? You had Owen Williams coming in at 10. You had Mason Grady making his debut. So that Grady-Hawkins centre partnership has, has got basically no experience, very limited. 
brought back in Falato and Tipperick into the back row, trying to sort of change things there, having played the younger guys in the in the second week against Scotland. It just sort of feels as though he's kind of with three losses now. They look like they might get the wooden spoon. There's that game in Rome against Italy to finish up. There's an argument in my head of does it matter because I think he's just trying to sort of plug holes here a bit, Charlie, isn't he, Gatland, and just try and work out what is going to work for him moving forward and also what isn't. Well, he's sort of picked two hybrid sides, hasn't he, for the last two games. So he's gone really, really young forwards against Scotland and then really young backs against England. And actually both times the kind of younger division has probably been a little bit... Better. I thought mm. that um, I thought that the two centres went pretty pretty well. Mason Grady is clearly made of the right stuff. He's a big guy. Didn't seem particularly. Sounds like a league player who's got lost. <laughs> he, <but. laughs> yeah, he does actually. <laughs> um, but look, didn't look overawed kind of psychologically either, and certainly didn't look out of place physically. Um, Louis Rissamit. I know he. I know he. He spilled that high ball, and he can. He's. Um, you know, can be slightly iffy defensively, but looked really dangerous kind of buzzing around and, and sweeping around in kind of a deeper when um, a deeper role when Wales had the ball in phase play and then the then the I thought Tommy Ruffell when he came off the bench that was where it started to get really edgy edgy for um, for uh, England and he went in I think at 15-10 at he went hard at a breakdown in kickable range um, for Wales and was very close to getting must have been very close to getting rewarded by Matthew Renau so um yeah, I was surprised that he he didn't actually he didn't actually start Rafael. Uh, so maybe that's the answer. Maybe that answer has kind of manifested itself to Gatland, which is just to go all out and go all out with youth. Um, see how far they get because they're on the same side of the draw as England in this World Cup. So you know they won't have to play hugely well to get get a semi final and it's job done and then onto their next cycle with a load of youngsters who. You know, who who have the who'll ha, who'll be buoyed by confidence, ha, have that little bit of experience to go ahead. I think I said Wales go to Rome on the final day, but of course that's wrong because they're there next week and then they are in Paris for the final game, which is suddenly a very horrible finish. I think when they did that a couple of years ago, they just stayed in Marseille for the week and didn't go back to Wales, which actually at the moment might be quite Not a nice, yeah. <laughs> might be quite a nice thing to do just to get out of the. Uh, Get out of the situation for a few days. Um, right, let's move on from that game. And Charles, we're going to chat more about what happened in Paris on Sunday. Okay, Charles, we've touched on France's win a little bit. Uh, after the loss to Ireland, I saw Sean Edwards speaking post-match against Scotland said that in that Ireland game they sort of played, I think he called it seven-a-side rugby in Dublin and that they just didn't stick to their kicking strategy enough and, and that actually they reverted to that. And they were better for it against Scotland. It, it, quite an up and down game, though. D- did you get the sense that France were were creeping back to their best, or is there work to do? I think I think there's still work to be done. Um, I think Jamie Ritchie after the game said that Scotland knew that they were fitter, and I would I would actually I would actually back that. I think France came in waves. Certainly, the the opening the opening piece of of, of the match, where when France play. At that pace, with the power and uh, sort of ball carrying threat at their disposal, they're they're nigh on in, impossible to stop. The problem that they have is that when they don't get that momentum, when they don't get that quick ball, they actually look a, a, a little bit clueless, really. Um, and you, you know, you you're reminded of that Roman, a horrendous Untermach, uh, Roman Untermach drop goal attempt that was a horrible scuff that just came after a on the back of a pretty good attack, uh, and even I think even if he'd have got it, the Stade de France uh, crowd would have groaned. Um, and and yet, I just don't think that that back line is clicking as well as it should. I know that they missed Jonathan Dante at twelve, um, but we said it last week. Um, I can't remember if we said it on or off air, but it's becoming even more pertinent now that all those sort of quite boring cliches about France that Galtier had worked so hard to to eradicate are sort of rearing their ugly heads again. You know, they're not travelling too well. Their away record under Galtier is not not incredible. Um, and at the minute, it is getting to the point where you don't know which French team are going to turn up because realistically, before that game yesterday... The prediction, any a, a rational prediction, could have been a narrow Scotland win or France winning by twenty points. You know, it, and and 
and, and that's their problem at the minute is that those sort of in the, the back of the mind that those sort of the things that have plagued France throughout the past 20 years and and longer really the inconsistency the mental application it, it's starting to grow a little bit and it's starting to come back we thought that Sean Edwards might have eradicated it and I think for the large part he has but this England match now is looking massive for them because they haven't won there in the Six Nations since 2005. It's a massive opportunity for them to put down a statement. Um, they beat Scotland, yes, and they beat Scotland comfortably in the end on the scoreboard. But I don't think it was a it was a statement win necessarily. I think it was statement on the scoreboard. But until the 78th, 79th minute, Scotland was still in a shout of winning. Um, and as I said, if you were doing player ratings for that game, which thankfully I I did not, um, the, <laughs> the 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 French, I'm not, I'm not sure anyone in the French backline really would have been looking at more than a more than a six out of ten. Maybe Fiku at seven, eight. The rest would have probably been looking at six. I mean, Dumortier looks like a fantastic talent. What on earth he was doing, stepping into three Scotland defenders to finish that try rather than diving for the corner? I have absolutely no idea. Penno is a freakish talent, the best winger in the world, but touched the ball in attack. Whoa, I whoa, think. whoa, whoa. That's a good statement. Yeah. The best winger in the world. I think, I, I think, I, I think he so, walks into a world 15 on the right wing. Charlie, any objections? He's all knees and elbows, isn't he? Yes. He's really, <laughs> he's a, he's a, he's an octopus. Disgusting to tackle. Yeah. He's the French octopus. He, he was quiet though. He's, cause yeah, he barely touched the ball. In that, against Ireland. He was quite, I think he got four, I think he got four, four carries. Um, which you know, and France are so good at, at giving their blockbuster talents kind of rope to do something with in in a game, and he just didn't really seem to get into the game. It's really bitter. I agree with Charles. Really bitty performance from the France backline on the back of what was. I mean, some of the some of the the when they're coming around the corner and you've got just big units yeah. like Valencia and and like Falatea came on and was. Dynamite, <laughs> really, really dynamite again. Having it with the, with Charles having picked him up a, a couple of weeks ago, but yeah, you'd expect a backline to really capitalise on the back of that, and it didn't really happen. The um, the an- the Anthony Jalonch injury is, is a bit of a sickener, isn't it, Charles? Tragic. Like Gaut- I think Gautier said afterwards that the the first diagnosis was that he'd torn a cruciate ligament, which would rule him out nine months in yeah. the World Cup. He's just such a vital defender, isn't he? I think did the injury actually happen when he was making that try saver on Van der Merwe in the corner? Was that when it was that when it happened? I think it might have done. Yeah, I mean, certainly for twenty five minutes, if you were doing player ratings, no one could argue with a nine or a ten for Anthony Jalonch. He was absolutely absolutely magnificent in that opening 25 minutes and the fact that he's now a doubt for the World Cup after having been rushed off for an MRI scan at half time um, yesterday is absolutely devastating news for him for Toulouse for France you know Fabian Galtier in the post-match press conference never gives much away but you could tell there was genuine genuine upset on his behalf and on the face of uh, of Antoine Dupont because Antoine Dupont obviously plays with um, Jolange at Toulouse and they're both part of this um, fabulous Oche contingent from the Gias in, in southwest France. They came from the same club um, in the in the age in age grade rugby. So he know he's known Anthony Jolange for for years and years and years, and you could tell that they were both gutted for him, absolutely gutted. Two red cards um, in the first 10 minutes, but actually I don't think there's been too much debate about either of them. Everybody seems to be on the same page with them, Charlie. The Grant Kilchrist one, I think, is it's particularly fair enough. Watching it back, he's sort of far too high with the shoulder. And then the Mohamed Hauras Ar- one, I mean, he just hates Scotland, doesn't he? Because that's his <laughs> second red card in, in three tests. And or loves I was them. there at Murrayfield when he... When he punched someone and got red carded, that was like the last test before COVID, wasn't it? I, 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 yeah, that was it. That was it. He, he great did, still of that. Didn't like Jamie Ritchie, and now, he, and now he's he's done it again. I asked Gregor Townsend in the post-match press conference uh, whether he'd be encouraging Fabian Galtier to always pick Mohamed Awas against Scotland, and he declined to answer, um, which was a shame. Um, yeah, I know. Um, but yeah, the only thing is the, the Grant Kill Chris one, Stonewall Red, but not a dirty player, unintentional, just got it a bit wrong, um, and deserved Red. There were no complaints from anybody. Similarly with Awas, uh, the only thing that I couldn't tell in the stadium because I was far away and we didn't see a, a very good re- replay, I'd be interested to know whether the contact from Awas to Ben White 
the initial contact was to the head. I know there was head contact, but I'm wondering whether he hit the shoulder first. Ben White didn't go off for an HIA, which is sometimes telling. I know you we shouldn't read too much into these things. Um, I know it looks like I'm sort of defending the indefensible here, but I think that everyone was very quick to to sort of lay a lot of guilt at Alwas's feet because of his record. I, I, I don't doubt that it, it, it was a it was a red card. Um, if it well, if he does, if he has made contact with the head first, it's obviously a stonewall red. But I did just wonder that because I, I don't think from the pictures and the replays we saw that it was quite conclusive. That's now two French tight heads out with suspension with Antonio and with Howes. But I mean, the Valete has been playing so well that it's probably not the end of the world. Um, Charles, there's been a lot of praise for the French um, doctor Philippe Turblan on on Twitter for his sort of actions. Can you sort of mm. give us a bit of detail into why that's the case? Of course, so it was a bit. It was strange in the stadium because after after Grant Kilchrist had caught Anthony Jalant, Jalant stayed down. Um, after he'd been caught in the head, he stayed down, um, and the play continued. And this, the French medic came on and said, "No, we need to stop." And went up to the referee, the Georgian referee Nika Ramashikeli, and said, "No, play needs to stop because um, Anthony Jalant needs to go for an HIA." And it was sort of. In that delay of of Anthony Jalonch asking of Anthony of Anthony Jalonch being forced off for an HIA, gave the sort of TMO and the officials time to have a look at the incident that had taken on the big screen and that sort of intervention. While I have no doubt that it was made in the best faith from the French doctor, did sort of lead to the Gilchrist red. And actually, at the time, because. Jamie Ritchie had gone up to the doctor and sort of tried to get him away from the referee. I did wonder whether uh, the doctor was sort of going up to the referee and saying, look, you need to have a look at this on the big screen, which obviously we don't want to see because we don't want medics refereeing the match. A referee's job is hard enough as it is. Yeah, it's a really interesting point. Um, Charlie, can we just touch on Scotland? Um, Finn Russell threw the intercept for the Thomas Ramos try, but we'll let him off that because otherwise he was really fun. Of course he was, yeah. He's just fun, isn't he? He he makes everybody entertained. To plug the BBC's uh, Rugby Union Daily podcast, they did a really good interview with him in the lead up to this game in which Russell sort of, in in the kind of way that he had, said, oh, I'm actually, you know, pretty pretty good at shrugging off mistakes and carrying on playing. Um, And sure, he sure did that. (laughs) True to his word. I don't don't know whether part of that is... To go from um, to go nineteen nil down, you're just only you're giving yourself one way of playing and, and one way it's you know it's all or nothing. But also, it kind of shows that Scotland have sh- have they've got this far by showing in the Six Nations real conviction in their attacking play. So if you think about how they were close with England and then pulled away on the back of going going wide from deep, and then the same with Wales. Wales stuck in the game, made it difficult for 50 minutes, and then Scotland pulled away again. Um, they had no choice but to do that in, in Paris, but they did that really nicely. And Finn Russell is obviously going to be, always be at the fulcrum of that. There were other big performances. Hugh Jones, fantastic. That felt like a statement. Um, I had, had a few people sort of saying, well, obviously he was going to pick Hugh Jones because he's been going so well for Glasgow with Sione Tiwi Pilotu, but also uh, dropping... Chris Harris and making him less of an influence in, in the side is a big call and really shows how you want to go about things. So credit to Gregor Towns and then Ben White, probably a big call to, to stick with him. He's been having a fantastic uh, championship. George Turner too at hooker and then actually bringing on, felt, felt for Hamish Watson um, being sacrificed, but Johnny Gray came in as a sort of specialist mauler, specialist kind of... Um, his work rate of defence is huge, isn't it? And and that came off as well. So they're doing they're just making really clever decisions and backing themselves and backing their way their identity, which is a reason which kind of shows why or how what happens when you're further ahead in a World Cup cycle. Because they just they just have that confidence in who they are and how they play. Um, and that allowed them to get really close to upsetting France and going four for four. Such a shame three from three, sorry, such a shame that they're not um, and it's not a kind of um, the Grand Slam isn't on the line for both sides when they host Ireland, but that is going to be an awesome game. Feels like feels like every week you're looking at who Scotland are playing, and and just going that game's going to be tasty. I was going to say we essentially can't wait to watch Scotland every week, which is a very high compliment because it hasn't always been that way. It hasn't always been that way. Same past. with Italy, though, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, it's a real shift in direction in terms of we actually want to see those teams now, whereas before we might have a. We might have passed them over. Okay, let's wrap up by looking at the final game, or well, the first game actually that took place this weekend, but the final game in our roundup, which is what happened in Rome when Ireland took on Italy. 
So Charlie, Ireland made a couple of changes. They went to Rome. They got a, a win, as everybody expected. But the manner of it was very different, wasn't it? Because Italy gave them all sorts of problems. What, what impressed you most about Italy? Again, as we were just talking about Scotland, their, their faith in themselves, I think, to, to give it a crack. I think they're also, they've just got players that suit that way of playing. Kieran Crowley's kind of implemented it. And, you know, they had a pretty... Apart from the apart from the win over Wales, and obviously they beat uh, Australia as well in the autumn, but they they had a quite a rocky twenty twenty two in in parts, and they've come through that. And these young players that did so well at under twenty level, I looked at um, Renzo Canoni only being twenty two last only turning twenty two last month, shot because he just lo- he just looks this real kind of assured nature about mm. him, and and he and what I mean by him fitting into how they play is that he's. You know, he's he's pretty kind of abrasive when he's making those narrow carries, but equally he's he's really comfortable when he moves out wide, as he did um, in the build-up. I think to Varney's Varney's try. Um, yeah, they're just a, they're just a fun team, and it was it was it Brex with that kick pass that just went out on the full. That mm. was, you know, they're in touch there, and if they capitalise on that attack, um, you know, <laughs> then it's re- it's really game on. But the way that they're breaking down teams. Is because they're staying true to themselves. They've got that faith in that ball movement and those skills that they've worked really hard to kind of polish, um, and they just they just look like a well coached, well put together side. I think Charles touched on it earlier, but there's something quite nice about how in the past it, the the big Italy famous Six Nations wins were they were gritty and they were sort of born on the back of the pack in sort of moments of individual world class players like a Parise or a Castro Giovanni or a Diego Dominguez to go back even further it is different now isn't it because it is a, a system and there does seem to be an overall philosophy which everyone is buying into and actually they're, they're playing so well as a side that again they've become sort of kind of compelling to watch I love the balance in that back row in particular you talked about Canoni's carrying but then you've got Lamoro as a fetcher Negri as a line out option just sort of a big hefty blind side that works really really well Halfbacks work well. Capoazzo actually has been has been very good, but he hasn't necessarily had to be the star of the show because everybody's kind of doing their bit, and that's what which is also quite nice. It's not all on in his shoulders to kind of deliver performances. Uh, just on Ireland, I thought Ireland when they were when they were very good, they they were just so fun to watch. Bundyaki came in and uh, outside centre and was having a lovely time, wasn't he? Sort of barreling through defenders and sort of setting up, especially down that short side with James Lowe. The combination there just works really well. Matt Canson got a couple of tries. Ar- Ireland weren't perfect and it was it was tight at one point at 2024 20, for a long period in that second half. But I, I think even though Italy is so much more improved, you never truly felt that Ireland were going to lose. You always felt that they would get over the line. Is yeah, that fair? No, I think so. Yeah, the, uh, Apart from in that in that little passage um, in the second half where Italy were coming on strong, um, looked slightly hairy, but they've just got players that are just remarkably consistent at the minute. So Kellen Doris moved across to six, almost inevitably good. Josh van der Fleer the same, Hugo Keenan at fullback the same. Um, he was excellent, as he always seems to be. Um, good to get, as we as we foreshadowed on, on the podcast, good to see um, Casey and Burns start. Casey, I think it's just it's emerged post-match that he had an injury leading up to the game. Um, but came through it well, and, and you know we know what his USP is. He's he's he would be a sort of more. I don't know, they're probably about the same amount of experience, but him and Alex Mitchell kind of fulfilling the same kind of role as far as just zipping in, zipping ruck to ruck, and, and playing passes to facilitate um, facilitate a kind of more smooth phase play. Um, but no, yeah, over, overall they'll be better for coming through that again Ireland because it's just another scenario where they're being, they're being ruffled a little bit by a side who, who are um, capable and willing to move the ball and they've got some big players coming back well, I was going to say Charles let's chat about the cavalry coming over the hill because it's pretty great isn't it so you've got Jamison Gibson Park Robbie Henshaw and Tyg Furlong also Johnny Sexton and Gary Ringrose I mean they've got this in the bag haven't they well, yeah, poor old Scotland. I think that's the that's the first thing to say. But it, it, it's 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 good timing because Ty Furlong, it, 
has been has been missed because he's a world class tight end prop. And Finley Bealham went down injured, and Tom O'Toole has been good off the bench. But they'll be glad to have him back, especially with how well Pierre Schumann's been playing and his scrummaging on the loose head. They'll be really glad to have Furlong back on the tight end um, more more that more so than the others, I think, because I think they've plugged the other gaps very well. And Finley Bealham's been solid, and he was very good against France. But Ty Furlong's just in a in a different class, really. In a different, you know, you're looking. I, I don't want to make another massive claim, but you're looking sort of best tired in the world oh no that's fine we, I think everyone universally will agree with you on that I don't think you'll get any opposition <laughs> had, had a tricky time at Twickenham didn't he oh, oh um, okay. against and that's what against again we'll yeah. Get onto that. yeah and we'll get onto that um, well that's not till the final weekend is it but if it goes down to the wire um, we'll talk about how England might play but they they pared it down to Trouble Island last year didn't they but when they had to with Charlie Eels' red card so they'll they'll and, and in previous years, they have, you know, traditionally um, squeezed Ireland a bit. So that'll be a, a test coming down the down the pipe for Ireland. But no, they look they look so strong. Quite the selection quandary in the centres because McCluskey's played quite well. Aki looked great against Italy. But if you've got Henshaw and Ringrose available as Jeez, well, yeah. you're balancing fitness with form. Four kind of gun centres to choose from must be nice. Yeah, uh, yeah, fit. and really balance whoever they put there, really. Um, but you know that. But they can go for those they can go for two of those you know not that not that ring rose is a is a weak is a weakling or anything but they can go with two of those big lads because of how well keenan complements the um the, their fly halves so they've just got that they've just got that really nice balance and and andy farrell has um pushed through a tricky period with the with the attacking kind of template that he wanted to implement and now he has 25 30 players who are in tune with that way of playing and can slot it absolutely the team to be right let's finish off this week with a few of your readers questions and a quick chat about Owen Farrell as well okay let's finish up this week with a few of your readers questions thank you very much for sending them in as always um first one from Adam is about Farrell and it's is Farrell's goal kicking becoming an issue which you sort of touched on earlier but more sort of broader has Borthwick backed himself into a corner by naming him captain should Borthwick look to change the captain ahead of the World Cup and who would the options other options actually be as captain away from Farrell Charlie if I come to you first are, are we sort of hitched to own Farrell do you think until the World Cup now oh first part of the question yes we, we touched on that earlier didn't we goal kicking is certainly yeah. a an issue um I've got a bit of a theory on this whenever they've spoken about leaders they have obviously heap praise on on Farrell but they've also spoken about the leadership kind of leadership density inverted commas and said that they come as a as a trio of leaders with Ellis Genge and Courtney Laws I wonder whether he revisits that gives him the out to revisit it ahead of the World Cup if say for instance George Ford returns looks excellent I think Farrell will always be certainly in the, in the lead up to the World Cup will always be in a best 23 for England now um, certainly because he can you know he can cover 12 if they want that and want a fast kind of expansive finish to a game um, but if somebody like Ellis Genge or well Ellis Genge and, and Courtney Laws are those designated vice captains aren't they and if you if you've got them there doing that and they clearly value them because they're bigging up bigging them up as a three the whole time then you have that scope to change it within a tournament so there are options there, and they've sort of um, foreshadowed it, I think. Charles, what do you, how do you feel about Farrell? Do you think that he will be, when's that first game? The World Cup down in Marseille against Argentina? Is he the one who's leading them out? Yeah, I think so. I think he is the preeminent leader in, the, in, in English rugby and in this England team. Um, yeah, he didn't have his best game on Saturday, but I think everyone's allowed a bit of an off day. He's... Um, he, he, People always talk about a lot of the unseen stuff with Farrell and how he's a tone setter, the rhythm setter of the team, and nobody has anything but high praise for him. Whoever's coached him, whoever's played with him, you never hear a bad word said about him in terms of his drive and his character and his competitiveness. Um, and we know he has the skills. We know he has the skills um, because he's been a part of some of England's greatest wins in the last 10 years since he made his debut greatest ever wins that have occurred in the past 10 years uh, he's been excellent for Saracens this season anyone anyone who's watched Sar Saracens regularly will concur um, so yeah 
I think he'll be captain come the first game. And I think, on balance, he deserves it. He deserves it. And he's got two massive games here um, to set the doubters straight in, 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 over the, in the final two rounds against the best two teams in the world. That's a really good point, actually, because if he's these two facing these two teams back to back it's a sort of rigorous examination of everybody in this side but particularly the leadership and, and who knows what, whether Courtney Laws might come back into the starting team but yeah I think Farrell's really going to be under the microscope I, I also think he will be captain but I am still sort of fascinated with what an Ellis Genge led England might have looked like and I sort of wish that we'd at least had a look at it during the Six Nations period but partly just because of the Genge and Borthwick connection from their time at Leicester and and what a success that was. I, I do, part of me still wonders about that, especially because Genji is such an automatic starter. Like I feel like we're still, I think we think Farrell's going to start, but we don't know if he's going to be a 10. We don't know if he might move back to 12. Now Ford comes in, Laws has been coming back from injury. That There's sort of an, an unscratched itch there for me with, with Genji. And I, and I wonder, I wonder what that might have looked like. Yeah, interesting. I th- I, well, we know what a, we know what a, a Courtney Laws England look like, looks like. He's had a little bit of time at the at the helm there, um, yeah, and that's and that's they're all options, aren't they? Laws, yeah. but obviously, with Laws, you've got the caveat that um, you wonder with that little spell whether he does make it through to twenty twenty three. But he looked the World Cup, sorry, and um, we're in twenty twenty three now. But um, I, mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, as far as you know, getting getting through that tournament, but he, you know, he came back pretty pretty strongly. He looked pretty influential. Full of energy at the weekend. We also know um, what a um, what a Genge and Borthwick led side looks like, you know, yeah. from from yeah. from the from the Leic- from the Leicester season, and it, that ended in that ended in a you know a rank triumph, frankly. Yeah, I think that's why it intrigues me. I I, I think also it's worth adding on Farrell that Farrell, I think we've all accepted at this point, will be valued higher by teammates and coaches around him than he will be by the wider public. And and actually, his stock is just so much higher. What was the um, inside the camp than outside? The pub you were in were they were they hating him? Oh, there was an effigy of Farrell <laughs> in, the, in the corner. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, I, I think it was more. He's missed another one. Grumble, grumble. But in, but in, see but in phase play, because that, I've seen a lot of kind of criticism of his phase play too, which I actually didn't. I didn't think it was. It w- awful. I mean, it wasn't awful. No. It wasn't awful. But it, but he's not. He's not Finn Russell, and, yeah. and I think that's that is probably it, isn't it? It's sort of the perspective shifts. People people just want the. I think people want the flashier player. But stuff like you raised a very good point in a tweet on Sunday that actually, how many tackles did he make? Seventeen tackles. Seventeen. I don't think he gets enough credit for the defensive work he puts in either, and and that is just as big an, an aspect of the game as the attack. If you want to win test matches, even if it's not as fun. We had another question from the travelling reserve who said the tournament needs to get rid of at least one of the rest weeks. Momentum for the tournament is killed after round two. Ireland v France was fantastic, and this round is in round three. So like, he's basically saying that all the momentum was lost. What do you What do you think? I mean, we're sort of in this age of player welfare where we're trying yeah. to bang the drum for resting players. Charles, would you ditch your rest week, or are you, are you happy as is? I couldn't agree more. In an ideal world, you'd play all five rounds back to back. Not going to happen in the in the player welfare world, unfortunately. Players need their rest. Players deserve their rest, um, and that's the reality of the situation. Quite an easy one, but yeah, it is a shame. I agree. Charlie, would you? Premiership clubs would like it when they have more more availability, and then potentially kind of yeah more commercial opportunities with the best players available. But then they're also getting flogged because they played five games, five tests in a in a row. It's a really difficult balance. We're recording on Monday morning, but I'm really intrigued if there might be any surprise player releases for the Premiership games this weekend I'm thinking Arundel needs game time Smith he only had 15 seconds might as well let him go play for Quinns yeah France Ex- France Exeter on Saturday France have only retained 17 players that's it so, wow. so oh, that's interesting yeah okay France have retained 17 okay. players so that tells that you LNR LNR flexing muscle a bit well, I think it's part of the agreement, yeah. But I mean, right. I mean, the, the likes, you know, you know, Makalu and Baptiste Kuyu, Seko Makalu and Baptiste Kuyu didn't even get off the bench yesterday, so you know, they need they need a game. I've always wondered how to say his surname. Thank you for for clearing that. Kuyu. Yeah, yeah, would never, never have guessed. Well, listen, keep your eyes on the Telegraph website because you'll find out who's been released and who might be turning out for their clubs this weekend. Okay, that's it for today. Thanks to Charles and Charlie as always, Charles try and get back safely from Paris we're sure that you will 
There's no Six Nations this weekend, but there will be Premiership action, so keep an eye on the website for all the latest match reports and previews and news stories, and also expert analysis from Gavin Mayers, Will Greenwood, Brian Moore, and the rest of the Telegraph Sport crew. If you've enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, please tell your family and friends, and we'll see you next week. Goodbye.